Welcome to the Recruiter Startup Podcast. My name's Dilta Daharde, and in this podcast series, I'll be interviewing investors, advisors, founders, and recruiters who are based all over the world in how to set up, scale, and run a world-class recruitment agency. This week, I'm speaking to Derek Kenny. Derek is from Dublin, and he's worked in Australia, and he's worked in Asia. His journey is just amazing. I mean, he, he, left, he left school without any formal qualifications, got into door-to-door sales, knocked on the right door, and ended up getting a recruitment job, which has taken him all over the world. Currently, he's living in Hong Kong. He is a partner at Cornerstone Global Partners, who are a massive recruitment agency in Hong Kong and in China, and they are scaling at an exponential rate. So we kind of got into a lot of stuff. We, 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 we talked about his journey of what takes him, what took him to this point, and you know what drives him every day and how he runs his business, his life, and how disciplined he is. Really inspirational uh, conversation. And, you know, it just got me pumped. I just want to go and build my business now. And I- I'm sure you'll be the same if you, uh, if you listen to this. And you get a taste of what it's like to live in China. And, yeah, better I just put you over and l- you listen to it because um, he is a great guest. We spoke for nearly an hour. So you might end up listening to this on your way to work and from it and um, really enjoyed speaking to Derek and appreciated his time and coincidentally he used to work for our our, our Friday's guest um, which is Ken Harborn and uh, and yeah so it's it's just amazing how everybody in our little agency recruitment world seem to be connected one way or another anyway hope you enjoy let us know cheers Derek Kenny, how are you today? I'm good. Dualta, how's it going? By the way, is it Dalta or Dualta? Neither. Dualta. <laughs> Dualta. Uh, there we go. No worries. Yeah, so, sounds good in your Irish brogue. Yeah, well, my accent's actually quite tame now, I think, to when I first arrived. Yeah, so uh, look, thanks for joining us today. Really excited to hear about your story. How we normally begin things is uh, I just kind of ask you, how did you get into recruitment and uh, how did that whole experience happen? Yeah, so I was, I actually left school before I did my leaving cert. And uh, I was going to school in Walkinstown in Dublin, you probably know it. Um, and then I went straight into doing door to door sales. What were you so selling? I was doing charities for an Irish charity called Gorda. So for a charity in Africa and you're raising money for the kids over there and so on. And I was doing pretty well at it, actually. It's for a company called the Cobra Group. It's quite a commercial organization and they have a charities division. And I started off with those guys doing door-to-door sales. You know, you're knocking 100 doors a day in the freezing cold, the rain and so on. So the training was, was really, really good. One day I'm out knocking on doors and uh, I knock on a guy's door and he tells me not interested and you know, shut the door on me. I kept walking down the street, knocking on more doors, pitching the guys, and I just see this fellow walking down the street after me. And I thought, what's this guy walking down the street after me for? Have I done something on him? And uh, he said, here's my business card. I've never seen anyone take rejection like you before. You should come and work for me. And it turns out he was the MD of a, a large American listed recruiting business, and he was their MD and country manager for Ireland. I wasn't too interested at the time. I was actually quite happy knocking on doors. I had a team doing it and I was enjoying myself. I was going Are you to able to say who that was? Ireland. Um, it was Ken Harbour and at Robert Half International. <laughs> he was our guest on uh, Friday. Yeah, so I, I was very lucky actually that that happened and I'm eternally grateful to Ken. So it's, uh, you know, I, I owe him a lot actually. Um, 
yeah, so I, I called him one day. It was raining out, and I'd had enough of the door-to-door sales, and I just gave him a show. And uh, he said to me at the time, you know, what What took you? Are you not knock, out knocking on doors every day? So um, then I went in to see him, and, you know, I hadn't really got any... I'd only done leaving cert, not even leaving cert education. So I wasn't corporate in any way. You know, I grew up in a council estate in Tala. So to me, it was a whole new world going into work in a, you know, an office in, in Pembroke Street in Dublin to work for Robert Half International. And I think he put me through about four or five interviews at the time. And, you know, I was just very lucky to get the opportunity that he gave me. Um, just very, very lucky at the time. And I went into work with Ken and Robert Half, and they were starting up Robert Half at the time in Dublin. And there was, I think there was like five of us in the office, and we then set up the built the office for Robert Half in Dublin from scratch. So I got to see what it was like setting up a recruitment company from scratch in my first job in recruitment. I think I was 19 at the time. Wow. And uh, that experience put me in good stead forever because any time I've set up a new business I've always thought back to when Robert Half had their small little office with the whiteboard on the floor and we had um, Ken sitting there doing deals kind of carrying the office at the time and he just had to set it up from scratch so the I got to witness that and I got to experience it and it just uh, it taught me a lot and like I said until this day that's what I kind of revert back to whenever I'm setting up a new desk or a new business I'll go back to what it was like setting up the, uh, or being part of setting up the Robert Half uh, what, Dublin office. What specific things uh, did you witness in that journey? One great thing about the Robert Half business is that they teach you everything as a process and everything is, uh, is done in a, in a process way or you could call it, you have your own daily system. So I was very lucky in the sense that I learned that if you did the right activity, you got the results. And I've always stood by that, that if you do the activity, it doesn't really matter who you are, you'll get the results. And I also got to witness that things don't always go your way at the start when you're setting up a new business. It's actually very tough. And I remember back then, even though I was very young, I remember thinking to myself at the time they were having a few tough months. And I thought to myself, well, this is tough for these guys, even though they have so much experience and they have a big brand, big American brand behind them. What I saw when they just kept their heads down and kept working, kept working the system, that it all came through for them. And I saw that office go from pretty small to when I left, it was quite large. And then it, even, it got even bigger. I think it became like maybe 40, 50 people. And for people who, who are maybe at like a small recruitment firm, um, are setting up there. What, what does that system look like from a daily basis? Well, I think, you know, well, I just had, I had eight people start in our office here in Cornerstone today in Hong Kong, um, all kind of inexperienced people. And I just had a meeting with them before I got in this call and just simple stuff about doing their daily plan. And even for me till this day, I have a daily plan. When I come in in the morning, I have my daily plan, which gets me through the day. And, it makes sure I'm productive each day so I can get my business done, I can hire my people and I can get my billings done at the same time. I feel it all comes down to your planning aspect and you can be entrepreneurial all you like and you can be a great salesperson, but if you don't have the planning aspect nailed down, you're probably not going to get to where you want to go. You'll win some deals and you'll do well, but you just won't be consistent and it will kind of fall apart. So my advice to anybody who's setting up a business from scratch and a small business is to do their planning and stick to their activity, which is very simple. It's what you get told at the start. Plan your day, do your calls, do your meetings, you know, make sure you have activity at the end of the day, whether that's CVs getting sent into people's inboxes and interviews happening. And it doesn't change. It's still like that even for me today. And I run a business here. But I still go by and I still live by that activity. And so, so how long did you work for Ken and Robert Half in Dublin? I worked for those guys about two years, I think it was. Yeah, about two years. So you, can't, um, you almost did an apprenticeship as such in recruitment there. Yeah, apprenticeship. And you know what? I got this phone call from an Irish recruitment company. And I was a young guy at the time. And they were saying, 
you know, we'll offer you X, Y, and Z, and you can do this and you can do that. And, you know, they offered me the big salary because they found out I probably had a lot of potential. And I wouldn't say it was a mistake because it brought me to where I am now. But when I train guys up in my business, I have other recruitment companies calling them when they find out they're good. And I always tell them, watch out for the bright lights and don't get sucked into that. At the time, it was a bad move for me, actually. So I was doing really well there at Robert Half and, uh, you know, surrounded by great people. And then I made the mistake of jumping for the bigger salary, which, you know, I try to tell my guys all the time it's a mistake. And, you know, some of them actually do do it. You know, they move on for the bigger salary and the bigger commission and somebody kind of, I suppose, bullshitting them in a way. Um, so, yeah, I did my two years and that company I went to, I only stayed for a few months because I could see straight away it was... It wasn't a very well-run business. I was a young guy and quite naive. Mm. The guy who had hired me was a very, he was a nice guy in fairness to him, but wouldn't have ran a very well-run recruiting business. But he was spending a lot of money, you know, got caught in thinking I can make all this money. And I I've maybe foolishly made the move at the time. He tapped into your ego, hey? Yeah, maybe that. And they, I think they, they offered me, like a much bigger salary and a sign on bonus and all this kind of stuff. But it was a great lesson for me to learn early in my career because um, I then learned that this big salaries and the big commission payouts and all these kinds of things are useless to you unless you're surrounded by the right people. Anybody can offer the big salary and the big commission. Like literally anybody can do that if they have, you know, me behind them or some cash flow. But unless you have the right company and the right people around you, you're just not going to succeed no matter how much you're getting paid. Dublin so that Dublin's like that right me. now again. We're at the height of it. And, uh, you know, the, ki- the kids I speak to who might be at like a Robert Walters or one of the bigger players, and, yeah. you know, they're just, they're saying, oh, I've, uh, somebody's going to offer me 80,000 to do this. And they've never really done anything independently. Like it's all been part yeah. of the machine and having the best database in the world. It's it's very hard to it's very hard to tell them what the reality of the phone not ringing is like. Yeah, it's very difficult, and you know we all do it as human beings. It's human nature. We will all, if especially if we are kind of like the fighter types, the ambitious types, and we want to make it in the world. Unfortunately, there's two sides to that. It does make you very ambitious, and you want to make it in life and stuff like that. But sometimes you can just want it all too quickly, and then you make the wrong decisions. And I think that happens to a lot of recruiters. And then their careers are kind of on the scrap heap. Two bad moves and then nobody wants to really hire them. And looking back now, I know if you just stay in the same place, you're far more likely to make it. But I'm sure people will keep making that mistake for as long as the, <laughs> you know, the world goes on, and particularly in the recruitment field. And generally the companies that have to pay the huge salaries or the big commission checks, the upfront stuff. You have to be careful with them because there's a reason why they have to offer all of that upfront. You know, I, 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 I can't agree with you more. I, I went from, from Robert Walters where the commission, you know, is questionable and all the rest, but I had, mm. I had a machine behind me and I was earning good money and I was getting developed in the right way. And, and I did it for about three years. And then when I, we decided we'd move on, to Canada, I joined a large national company there, and they offered me fifty percent commission. Yeah, but <laughs> but fifty percent of what? <laughs> you know, it, it was yeah. you know it was it was an absolute disaster. And you know I'm trying to I try and coach that through recruiters that I deal with now, and it's really it's really tough to say that like to, to get that through to their head. You know, if if they're offering you something that's too good to be true there's a reason for it yeah and look if if you're very experienced and you know your market inside out then maybe you can go anywhere and you'll still make it but if you're at that level that i was at 21 and still learning the the business and so on and so forth it's a bad move you know Mm. um but if you have all the experience and you know your clients and so on and so forth and someone's going to offer you more money and like, you know, you can do the same job there and get paid the same amount of money. And if your prospects are the same, like, why not? But a lot of the time, that's not the case, you know. Did your ego take a hit whenever that didn't work out? 
Yeah, of course it did, 100%. Um, but again, great experience because now I can tell my young guys in my company about that experience I had and I'm able to kind of preempt it happening to them, which again, I can see it all the time when they start to do well. I see myself back when I was 21 and I try to spend as much time with them as possible and try to tell them it's about the people that they hang out with that maybe has the most influence on them. So yeah, the ego did take a hit, but in saying that it was kind of a good thing to happen because looking back, it teaches you a lot. Yeah. And what, what was, what was next? What was your next step? How did you, how did you kind of pick yourself up and dust yourself off? Well, I was, again, I was quite fortunate. I came across a company called Coxford Simons and Wilkes. I don't know if you came across them before in Dublin, they're a boutique a finance and accounting firm. And that was run by Susan Cox, David Wilkes and James Fitzsimons. James and David had sold careers register to CPL and they did their non-compete and their time out of market and they came back in and set up CFW, it was called, with Susan being the MD. So I got to join these guys who were businessmen. They weren't just recruiters. And they got to, they took me in as this raw guy and they really added a lot of polish to me and showed me how to not just be a phone guy, sales guy just doing recruitment but how to be a bit more polished and i had a very i had a very successful time with them i was one of the top billers in their in their office and i did i think it was two years and something with those guys before i went to australia what, what type of what I, type of stuff exactly did they did they like take the rough edges off you in terms of adding polish what does that mean is that the way you ask questions or yeah yeah it was around that not being so much of a sales guy as much although that's who I am at heart and that's who we'll always be as recruiters but I think focusing more so not not just on the sale but the relationship they were really good relationship guys like they had some great clients and they were just real relationship people they weren't so transactional if you know what I mean they were old school Irish business guys driven by relationships and they had so much business it was ridiculous the business was just flying in the door of that company and i loved how they just had these such great relationships with their clients and the clients really respected them they didn't view them as just recruiters selling to them all the time and i just really liked that aspect of it and they were a very high quality business they did a lot of senior executive search stuff which i never had exposure to and then your next, your next, your next move. You did the, you did the move that uh, most of us Irish lads do. Yeah, I wasn't interested in it before, actually. And people kept saying to me, "You should go to Australia." And um, I was saying, "I'm not interested. I just want to work in Dublin and settle down and buy a house and all that kind of stuff." But then I thought life was pretty serious for me so far. As in, I didn't go to college. I just finished school before my leaving cert, and I went straight into working. And I'd, I think it was a, a rec to rec had reached out to me from Sydney um, about an opportunity at Hudson in Australia. And I thought, well, I'll go over and I'll check it out. There was really great salaries on offer at the time. And I thought it, it'd be great Still is. You know, hanging out at the beach. And look, I have red hair and I'm as white as a ghost. So I was living in Bondi and that wasn't the lifestyle for me. <laughs> the sun is not for me, you know. Um but I went over and I, you know, I went over for a bit of fun and I worked with Hudson over there just kind of pre-2008 and I was doing the contractor desk and it was a great business. You know, it was, I think there was like three, four hundred people in the Hudson they're, office at the time in Sydney. Yeah, they're the fifth biggest uh, business in Australia as far as I know. They're definitely in the, in the top five. Yeah, it was, you know, I was a young guy again in my early 20s. I was on a working holiday visa initially. So I was going out every single night. And I was just placing the Irish accountants. I think I placed one non-Irish person when I was over there. So I got known for placing these Irish contractor accountants. And um, I was doing really well at, at the start and halfway through. And then we had the, you know, I suppose the downturn in 2008. But I, I had a, a nightclub promotions, small business on the side. And I was doing nightclub promoting and boat parties on the weekends. So I was... I was burning the candle at both ends as you do in your early twenties. And just the Hudson job was kind of just, that was my day job. But I had my night job as well as a, 
you know, doing the nightclub business and so we, on and so forth, you know, so it wasn't so serious. Yeah, is it fair to say you had like one foot in, one foot out of, of your recruitment career at that stage? Yeah, well, that that would have been the case because I got really into the 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 whole promoting scene. I really enjoyed it and that kind of took over um, what I was doing and, you know, I did love it, but, you know, staying out late every night, and so, <laughs> it's not ideal for you either, you know, but yeah. look, it was a great time. I had an amazing time in Australia and um, got to meet lots of great people. I love the Australians in particular because they, uh, they seem to get all the work done. Um, but in Hong Kong, we're working late every night pretty much, but the Australians seem to be able to get all the work done and still finish work at a reasonable time. Yeah, they definitely do. It's a good lifestyle. Yeah. So what, what, what was, what was next for you? Um, the, the, the recession obviously happened. I mean, you, you have a soft landing in Australia. You're, you're already a bit established, but it must have hurt a little bit. Well, see, the thing is, I was, one night I was at a comedy show in uh, Sydney and then I bumped into this Irish girl and as you do, fell in love with her and I went back to Ireland in the 2008 <laughs> session. I don't, I don't know what I was, was thinking. Was she worth it? <laughs> I won't answer that. <laughs> uh, the... Um, but I, I went back to Ireland just completely, you know, um, I suppose just all loved up, wasn't thinking straight. Um, went back from living in Bondi Beach. I had a lovely apartment in Bondi Beach and uh, went back to living in Ireland. 2008, the IMF were coming in. It's freezing cold. It's, it's pissing rain nearly every day. And I was going down doing meetings at Macquarie Bank and JP Morgan and, you know, really nice places in Sydney. You know, it's like a different world. Yeah. And next of all, I'm back in Dublin then in the freezing cold and the rain. And, um, you know, the, it's a great place, but it's not as, from doing business point of view, it's, it's not as convenient as what Sydney would have been. You know, it's really, recruitment in Sydney is great. You know, it's really nice. Um, everything's good. The clients are super nice. They're very easygoing. The Aussies are very friendly people. Like, they really are. You know, you call an Aussie to go down and meet them. They'll say, yeah, come on down. They're just very, very easy people to get along with. And in Ireland, it's not so much of that culture. I don't feel when you go back to do recruitment there, it's it's not as easy going as it would have been in Australia. So it was it was kind of I was thinking, you know, what have I done here? I've come back to Ireland in the middle of the recession. It's a tough business. You know, I, I bumped into Anne Herity from CPL at an event in, in Ireland a few weeks ago. And she just happened to sit down beside me when I was having breakfast. And I said to her, I said, uh, I said, yeah, I couldn't, I couldn't seem to get myself going in Ireland. She said, she said, when were you there? And I said, well, 2008. She said, Derek, who the hell could get themselves going <laughs> in Ireland then? She said, don't be so hard on yourself. Um, but it didn't work out between me and the girl I followed back to, to Ireland. So I thought, well, look, I, I maybe need to get out of here. I just couldn't seem to get myself going. When I went back, Sigmar gave me a gave me a job, and again I was like mid twenties then, twenty five at this stage, I think. So working with Sigmar again, I learned a lot from those guys that I use today running what, my business what, now. What did you learn? Uh, those guys are very good at how they treat. They 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 are very. Uh, they have a very good business in terms of how the atmosphere that they have in the company. Um, they're very very nice people to work with. Like they're just they're really and they're very good operators. They run a, those guys run a great business and you can see why people stick around in that company because they, they do lots of very nice company events. Um, AD, who's the CEO, I'm not sure if you've met him before, but he's a very outgoing guy, very nice, lots of personality and just, just very, very nice people, you know? And I remember working with those guys and when I set up my first company in Hong Kong, I remember having that kind of atmosphere and that's why people wanted to stick around. And that's, I, I learned that from those guys. Those guys were just super good at creating a culture where people wanted to be there. And it was just a very, very nice place to work. You can see why they win all these awards. You know, you, you named the awards for being a great place to work. I think those guys have it. Mm. So I was, very, I was very lucky to work there and that they gave me that opportunity in 2008 when the IMF was in. And yeah, I, I was just very lucky. I was doing the IT contractor desk and... I think they had just set up Sigmar again after their parent company had went bust. And looking back on it now, I think to myself, geez, it must have been such a stressful time for those guys at that time. And if I, if I look at what they've achieved, it's quite amazing. But they're, they're a very people business. Everything's about the people, you know? 
Hmm. And how long were you there for? I was with those guys for about a year. And then I was sitting in, um, in their office just off Baggett Street on Hume Street. And I emailed a mate of mine in Singapore. I was like, look, uh, I'm not too happy here in Dublin. You know, is there anything happening out in Asia? He then gave me a call at my desk that day. And he said, look, Derek, we have an opportunity out in Hong Kong. Are you interested? So I said, well, yeah, of course. And then his boss rang me and, you know, I spoke to those guys. And then they said, come on out off the back of that guy recommending me from my time with him in Australia, a guy called Sean Hilder. He's out in Singapore now doing the tech recruitment uh, business. And then off I went to Hong Kong. And that's really when my career really took off. Before that, I just, I didn't take it too serious, to be honest with you. I was always a very good recruiter, kind of naturally good at it, actually. And I didn't find it really hard work a lot of the time. You got in so young. Like, hey, yeah, I got in so young and I was just immature. You know, I was very, very immature, which most people will be in their early 20s. And, what what know, age I was were you now when you were moving to Hong Kong? I was 25. And, I didn't start the yeah, recruitment until I was 27. Yeah, so, <laughs> well, there you go. Right, I was 25. I already had quite a bit of experience behind me. I knew how to do the recruitment business, but... I just, I moved to Australia, then I went back to Ireland. I made some pretty bad decisions. Um, and I just thought Hong Kong would be a great break for me. And for some reason, I always felt I wanted to go to Hong Kong. It's very strange, because even when I lived in Sydney, I remember saying to some of my friends, um, I wouldn't mind going to Hong Kong at some stage. So Hong Kong just came up, and I thought maybe it was meant to be. What, what were those early days, days like when you moved there? Like, what was your first impression? Well, I did, as soon as I, I landed in Hong Kong, um, I just, I fell in love with the place, actually. I just thought, this is, this is, this is home. It, but is it the energy of the it, place? Or? Yeah, the energy is amazing here. It's, uh, it's, I, I just love this place. Absolutely love it. You know, I wake up here every morning and I just think, you know, I'm so happy to be living in Hong Kong. But my first few months went terrible out here. Like, really bad. I, uh, when I came out, I, I thought, I didn't even, I know it's ridiculous, but I didn't even look at the cost of an apartment. I just jumped on a plane and came out. And I, I remember, I think I had about 500 euro or something like that. And I was thinking, it'll be fine. No worries. Then you realize that it's, um, I had two weeks in apartment when I got here. Then you realize you got to pay three months up, up front for an apartment here. And the rents here are absolutely insane. Like it's just through the roof. And you're not going to rent a room like you do in Dublin and live in a big house with a few other people. <laughs> the apartments here are absolutely tiny. So what you pay for a whole house in Ireland, you would pay for a room in Hong Kong. And by Ireland, and I, by I, Ireland I just, you mean Dublin? Yeah, by Ireland, I mean Dublin, yeah. And I just, I just didn't have the, have the money at the time. And I was very lucky. I, I, met a, I met an Irish guy while I was here called Brendan Moorhead, and he was working at Macquarie Bank. And... Again, 25, just trying to make my way in the world. Didn't have, I kind of ran out of money, actually. I didn't have any money. I remember sitting in an internet cafe in Hong Kong, thinking to myself, what am I going to do? I've got no money. Um, I don't want to call back home to Ireland because I don't want to worry my parents. And I'm kind of stuck now. And it's recession I'm in a bad Ireland situation. Well. It's recession Ireland. Nobody has any money. I remember when I was leaving, my mother followed me out the door and gave me 20 euro. <laughs> <laughs> she was like here you go son you know take this and I remember going I don't need 20 euro come on and uh, yeah so again got here no no money and starting from scratch and this guy Brendan Moorhead who's one of my best friends now in the world he got talking to him and he, I just said look I messaged him a few, a few days later I was like here's my situation he said I have a nice big apartment why don't you come and stay with me and he gave me a spare room. He didn't know me from Adam, really. We'd only met each other, I think, once. And he gave me a place to stay. And he actually gave me a lender some money. Wow. And then, yeah, yeah, I was very lucky. And then, actually, it's funny. He came to stay with me then a couple of years ago. So I was able to return the favor because he went traveling the world. And then he came back to Hong Kong. And I was able to let him stay with me because I had a nice big apartment then. Brilliant. And, yeah, so it was good. And we're, we're best friends to this day, which is great. So I had to basically just hustle my way here in Hong Kong initially and then I was working for this private equity backed firm 
in Hong Kong, and they they were a bit of a they, they were a kind of a they were a joke because even in the first payroll they were like, "Sorry, we missed your payroll. You have to get it next month." And I couldn't believe it. I didn't want them to know that I was broke. I thought it would come across bad and stuff like that. So it just kept going on. And then I decided this place is just not for me. And the leaders in there weren't kind of billing. It was just a very bad atmosphere in the place. And I, I, I got a phone call out of the blue from a friend of mine I'd worked with before. And that was Derek Dorman in the Bahrain. You probably know Derek, do you? You've introduced me actually before, yeah. Yeah. So Derek had a very successful firm in the Middle East called Gulf Connections. And he said, are you in, uh, I see you're in Hong Kong. So I said, yeah, I'm here in Hong Kong. He was like, well, look, we're doing really well here in the Middle East. Um, would you be interested in setting up in Hong Kong? So I said, well, I don't know. We'd have to talk about it. And he said, well, I can fly over tomorrow and see you. So he jumps on a plane and comes out to Hong Kong with uh, another guy who was running the business with him in the Middle East. And we all went for dinner. And I think we shook on at 4 a.m. in a nightclub that we'd open up the office in, um, you without in a, Hong Kong. You were without a penny. Yeah, without a penny. And he often laughs about this. And I have a picture of the night we went out for dinner in Hong Kong. And he, he says to me sometimes, he'd say, Derek, that night, I would have never known you were so stuck. <laughs> he, said, cause I, he said, I just thought everything was going great. And that's what gave me the confidence to back you to set up the business in Hong Kong. <laughs> yeah, you're bluffing. I, yeah, I did. I I did bluff him. Yeah, at the time, and um, but how, I. How did you know? How I, did you know him originally? We worked together in Dublin, um, and we met at Robert Half International at the time. And Derek was kind of similar situation to me in Ireland. Um, things probably didn't work out as well. And when he got to the Middle East, kind of things took off for him, and he done really well out there, and he's doing really well now. I'll have to. I'll have to business. get him on as a guest next. Yeah. Time. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. So he's doing really well out there right now, and we, you know, we talk, we talk quite, um, quite regularly. So he set me up then, and we took a small room in uh, a building in Hong Kong. It was about the size of it. They called it the broom cupboard. It was about the size of you know one desk with no windows, and we just set up there. I think it cost about a thousand US a month, and that was for just one desk room with no windows. There was no co-working spaces then, like you have now. We work and all these fancy places. It was a Regis office in that tiny little room. And, is, is, and the, is Hong Kong like one of these places where you don't need to, like anybody can set up a business there or it, it's, is that a complicated process? It's, if you don't have a visa, it's a little complicated and um, you need to have some money in the bank, which, which Derek had at the time. And the guys, uh, they, they were backed by the Gulf Daily News, which was the biggest kind of newspaper or publishing group in the Gulf region of the Middle East. So these guys are quite famous, you know, the owner, like number six on the Arabian power list, so they're very, very successful guys, and we worked effectively directly for them, and Derek was the CEO, and then I'd set up the Hong Kong business, and we set it up. I set it up from scratch on my own in a room, and I knew I, I, knew I had to make it this time because I said, well, I have no choice. I just have to make this work. And sitting in the room from scratch every day on your own and just making phone calls into the banks in Hong Kong, and again, I'm an Irish guy, 25, in a room on my own, and I had no choice but to just start from scratch again, start ringing all the banks. We had no contacts out there, nobody. And at the time, one of the French banks said, OK, well, come in and see me. And that was uh, Sokjed, the, the French, you know, the big, the big bank. And tell me, what's it like, what's it like calling banks there? Like, is English, English widely spoken? Do you, do you get through to an Asian person or is it an expat? Or like, is, it, is that a tough, tough thing to do? It's a... Yeah, you're getting through to Chinese people, basically. And it's a very, very different, you know, it's a very, very different approach. You can't really go for the sales approach. You, you have to go for more so the, uh, you know, I suppose the relationship approach. And those guys called me in and they said, OK, we have a role which no other agency has been able to fill in a year, a whole year, right? And uh, it was for a, a very specialist front office developer. And I managed to fill it within a week. This guy just came out of nowhere. He was working for HSBC. He was available immediately. He just finished his contract and I placed him. And if we look at maybe Euro terms, it was about 30,000 Euro fee. Wow. Yeah. So we were in business then. That guy started immediately. Uh, that bank were actually very good payers. They paid us, I think, after two weeks. So we were in business. Then I hired 
a grad straight out of Hong Kong University called Robert Howe. And it was just me and him in this room then, right? We got another room with another desk. So it's just me and him. And then I had met a guy when I was out one night who was uh, processing a load of visas. And he was telling me they were very, very busy at the time. And he was just working so hard. And I called him the next day and I said, who are you processing all these visas for? And he said, it's Cathay Pacific. So I said, well, who, what's going on in there? He said, they're doing the biggest technology transformation they've ever done in the history of the airline. So then I said, well, give me a name. He was like, oh, no, I can't do that. I'll lose my job. Anyway, eventually I convinced them to give me the name. And then I couldn't get through to Cathay Pacific. So I called up their Adelaide office, and small office in Australia. And, you know, I, I told them I needed a number for this guy. And they went onto the system and they found it. And his name was Adrian. And I got through to him. And his response to me was, he said, you've hit the jackpot because they were hiring so many people. And me and that grad, Robert Howe, Robert Howe actually became the head of the head of Asia Pacific for Airbnb, the head of operations. Wow. So he went from working with me to that. He was a grad. This guy was just straight out of university. And I remember one month we were only in business at this stage, maybe six months. And we'd placed 10 project managers in a month into this Cathay Pacific project. It was They'd never done anything like it before. And we just absolutely nailed that. And we became their number one provider. And then from there, I hired people. And we, we, we got that office then up to about 15 staff quite quickly. And we had a great atmosphere. And you have to understand, I was 25, didn't have a clue what I was doing. And all of a sudden, I'm running a business. So it was quite... And I'm in Hong Kong. Yeah. And... I'm working for these guys that own the Gulf Daily News in the Middle East, which is like a very famous organization. And they're named like number five or six on the power list or whatever it was. Did you start so for a young guy? Yeah. Did you start, sorry? To feel, did you start to feel invincible at this stage? Um, yeah. Yeah. And we had a, it was a, like the business in the Middle East was doing really well. And, you know, the business in Hong Kong was, was doing really well for a company that I had just set up. So, you know, I was a young guy. So I suppose, you know, we were just having a good time when we were, running a great business with a great atmosphere time because the atmosphere was so good in the office we actually never had anyone leave that company it was crazy <laughs> there was very very little staff turnover people just loved working there and we you know we ran a very very good business for i think i was with the gulf connections group for about four or five years and i i went on this gobi desert this 250k walk or run through the Gobi Desert. If you Time magazine name is like the second toughest race in the world. Yeah, I've heard of it too. And at the time yeah, at the time I was going through some kind of personal um soul searching, I was thinking, do I keep on living this lifestyle of, you know, working and going out every night drinking with my mates? And I'd been observing very, very successful businessmen and I noticed that they all kind of lived pretty straight laced lives and they were very disciplined. And this was on my mind and you know, my friend called me to go on this Gobi Desert and I was very unfit at the time. So I'm on this Gobi Desert and, you know, shouldn't have been on it really. I was totally unfit and I had never ran more than 5K in my life. And all of a sudden I'm on this desert with like Olympians. So I was there with a the Spanish Olympic gold medalist talking to him and he's talking to me. Do I know Sonia O'Sullivan, who's a famous Irish runner? I'm like, <laughs> of course, you know, of course I know her. And I'm on this race with him. I shouldn't have been anywhere near it. You know, it's crazy. I, I could have died on that race actually. And um, so I'm on that race and I got to do a lot of soul searching and I thought to myself, you know, I'm nearly 30 now. I just want to get serious and, you know, kind of pack in cutting corners. I'm a very good recruiter. I know I can do that. I know I can make really good money, but I want to go to the really high level. I want to be rich. You know, I don't just want to be running a 20 person business, making good money. I want to be really, really rich and I want to run a very big organization and I want to be, you know, I want to run a famous brand. So on that Gobi Desert, I made the decision to stop cutting all corners. And I thought that's it now because I'd seen a lot of guys on that Gobi Desert, even some guys in their 70s running 250 K through a desert. It was crazy with their backpack on their back for the week and, they were living off the food and the backpack and so on. You meet these really amazing. And I'd met a few guys on that. And one of them rang me when I got back from the Gobi Desert. And he said, hey, there's a company in China. They're based out of Beijing and Shanghai. These guys are the absolute real deal. I'd like you to meet them. And he was referring to 
uh, Chris Watkins. I don't know if you know Chris Watkins, who is basically the founder of Cornerstone Global Partners. I don't. Yeah, so he's kind of low. He's kind of a, a low-profile guy, and um, he said, "Well, why don't you go and meet him?" And in my head, I was thinking, right, I had a letter to say I'd get twenty percent of the proceedings from a sale of Gulf Connections Group. So I went to him to try and sell him the company. Actually, went down to meet him for coffee in the Marriott Hotel in in Hong Kong, and again tried to plant seeds in his head. Would they be interested in acquiring a business and? so on and so forth. And anyway, lo and behold, a few months went by. I was still at Gulf Connections and I was going back and forth with me and Chris. And then I just decided, you know what, it's, it's time now because I want to get serious. And Chris is a very serious guy. He's a, he, he's a real businessman. He's kind of, he's, he's top class. So I said, I want to get serious now. And I called those guys and I said, okay, I'm ready now to join up with you guys. And then, I'm back to square one again, setting up a business from scratch in a room with one of my guys that I had previously with me, and we set things up from scratch again. And Chris had said to me, you can come in. We have 50 people now. We need the Hong Kong business. I'll do you a deal whereby you do X amount of revenue. You get the equity in the company and so on. So I thought, well, this is perfect for me because I can go and learn from these guys who are, you know, have such a great reputation and they, they had a great business going and I can get the equity at the same time. It was a great start for me. What year is this? In? So then we, this is, uh, this is four years ago in October. So, so you, you're, you're north of 30 now. I'm 33 now. Oh, right. Wow. 33 now. And then when we set up Cornerstone Global Partners, that's when everything changed because I had made a decision. That's it now. I'm 29 or whatever. Um, I gave up drinking. I was like, I'm not drinking anymore. I just completely gave up beer, which was a big decision for an Irish man yeah. to do, you know, because, you know, you have that. Is that a decision? You think just because you're did, Irish sometimes. Did that, did that stick? Are you still at it? Well, yeah, I don't, because I, I saw a very famous Irish businessman called Liam Casey in Shenzhen. He didn't drink. And this guy was the only Irish guy to look up to, really, for me. He had 5,000 staff in Shenzhen. And I got to meet him once, and I got to see him, and I got to talk to people about him. And they all told me about how he operated and the fact he didn't drink and he was so disciplined and, you know, he was just a serious business guy. And then I got to meet him and he was quite an intense guy, I have to say, in my meeting. But I thought to myself, I want to be like him one day. And I decided then that's it now. I went, I, I messaged one of the best personal trainers in Hong Kong, a guy called Alan Engelani. He's one of the kind of top fighters probably in the world, actually, in one FC. You should check him out, Alan Engelan, yeah, well. N-G-A-L-A-N-I. So I messaged him. I said, I need a trainer. I want you to train me every morning. I'm willing to start at 6 a.m. every morning. And then I, I started studying what makes people very successful. And then I noticed that most very successful people go to the gym in the morning. It's just the way it is. They do. They have some kind of habit in the morning, whether it's meditation, running, or the gym. Yeah, I was watching the Rock, I went into the him. Rock morning routine this morning. That's uh, that's exactly what he does. He gets up at four, does the gym, or meditates, goes running, does the gym, comes back, does some emails, and does breakfast with the family. Yeah, and it's it's right because the books tell us everything we have to do. Right, you look at all the most successful people in the world. Generally, unless they've got lucky, and it doesn't last too long, even if they do, they're normally highly disciplined people who get up very early in the morning. They get into the gym. They do their workout. And then they go get their business done. They look after themselves. They eat relatively healthy. And then they're in bed at a reasonable time, so they're fresh for the next day. So I had this blueprint. And I started getting up at half four every morning, which was crazy. Because I went from being out drinking every night with my mates, having a business, which was going well, to all of a sudden, ultra serious, getting up at half four in the morning, going to the gym, because I was about 15 kilos overweight at the time. Um, and I had to live this very disciplined life, morning time gym, just work my absolute ass off then from the morning until late night. And I was doing that seven days a week in Cornerstone. And, you know, I actually still do it. I'm still doing that. I don't get up at half four anymore. I'll get up about five or six now. I'll get down to my gym. I have my personal trainer, you know, most mornings of the week. And I just did a boxing fight in Hong Kong there about six weeks ago. I got beaten up, actually, but it was a very good experience. Well, yeah, the, and the I, 30s are quite unforgiving for fighting sports if you've been out of it for a while. 
yeah exactly and i i live that life now very disciplined get up early and um, get into the office get my business done and in cornerstone the company since i've joined has went from 50 people to now nearly 350 it's been probably the biggest success story in asia as a recruiting firm based out of asia or china in general the company is just it's it's an amazing organization and you know a lot of the staff have shares in the company and it's kind of like an employee operated business and the the leadership from the top is just you know it's phenomenal i suppose that's the only word i could use for it tell me what type of and what, what not, type of stuff did you bring from your previous experiences when you were when you were setting up a, a culture there well the culture was actually it was quite different because they were such a high performing business in cornerstone um and i became quite a serious guy as well i went from being you know a bit of a joker you know having a laugh all the time to this very serious guy who was just business pretty much and i found it quite difficult with just my intensity level i'm a very intense person and all i wanted to do was work all i wanted to do was work and get this business up and running and make money and make it successful that's all i wanted so i actually when staff came to join me here at Cornerstone, I had my key guys join me from my previous company who know me. So they knew me well. And then I had other people come in and join us. But I, I ran it at a much higher intensity level, like a much higher intensity level. So every day I was in like a machine. And I became the biggest pillar in the company out of the senior staff in the first year and the second year. Then the third year I dropped down a bit. And even now, you know, in my office a lot of the revenue would come through myself through the technology team. I kind of lead from the front do you think that, in that respect. Do you think that re when recruitment business leaders don't build, they're hiding? Yeah, until like, there's, a, there's kind of a rule, they say, until you get to about 10 million US dollars in sales, you shouldn't step away, away from, the sale, from the selling because the great thing about working with Chris Watkins was, he, he, and I'm still learning, by the way, he's still teaching me, he knows how to run a business, like a proper business. And the problem is with recruiters, when they go from recruitment to running business, they're not business guys. They're recruiters. And they don't understand how to make big profit. So if you want to make big profit, for example, you're a MD of a recruitment company, let's say in Europe, you can be the MD and still bring in at least 200,000 euros. Well, guess what? That 200,000 euros is straight to your bottom line. If you're not bringing in that 200,000 euros or 300, whatever it may be, 400, 500,000 euros, you're just a cost to the company. And if you have that multiplied across all different offices, let's just say you have 10 offices and you have each guy getting paid 200,000 euros a year by 10 offices, that's 2 million euros a year just in losses. But if you change that and you put them into billers, you've just made a 2 million profit or a 1 million profit. So it's just those simple little changes, which I look at recruitment companies today and, you know, we've been, we've looked at a number of businesses for acquisition and it's one of the most simple things you can do as a guy running a recruitment business is to be one of the top billers yourself. And then at the end of the year, you'll notice that your net profit is a lot better and you're not a cost. So again, if you multiply those offices, five to 10 offices and each MD billing instead of not billing, that's huge profit or loss. Yeah, of course. Yeah. And, yeah, and, I, and I, I do think they, I don't think they're hiding. I just think they don't know any better. They don't know any better. Either. I get asked a lot by recruiters, do you have any non-billing roles? <laughs> it's like, you only be doing this for three years. <laughs> well, you should, you should always bill because even for me now, I manage some of our key accounts and I love bringing in the business. That's what I love doing. I love mentoring the younger guys and I love bringing in the business. Um, but for you to keep your value in a market, even as a leader of a business. Now, our business is, um, like I said, 350 people now, nearly 350 people. If there's any business out there where the leaders probably should, you know, could get away without performing, it probably would be a business of that size. But even in our company now, all the leaders are still performing and still bringing in the fees because it, also, it, 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 it just permeates through the organization. It gets you the respect from the staff. It also um, keeps your, your worth in the market as well because you have to be known as a, a go-to person for your clients, maybe for the senior assignments. Um, the key ingredient to running a successful business. Uh, we've, uh, we've talked a couple of times about uh, expats coming over 
and you, you're always a little hesitant to take on people straight away. You think that there's quite a lot of differences personally and professionally when moving to Asia. Could you kind of elaborate a wee bit on that, that piece? Oh. Yeah, the, the reason I tend not to hire guys straight off the plane is that it takes them about a year to settle in. And then they go out every night having beers with their mates and stuff like that. And then they have hangovers the next day. And I hate to generalize, but that's normally what happens. And then I've always found if you let them come here for a year and then you pick them up, they're a lot more effective. Because when they get here, it's such a different culture. It's not like Australia, whereby you get off the plane and you can start making placements immediately. You have to learn how to deal with Chinese people and Western people are completely different. It's a very, very, very different culture. In Western culture, we're emotional people. We say what's on our mind. When you do business in China with Chinese people, you have to learn to keep your, your thoughts in your head. You have to be very, very careful what you say. Um, in the West, you can have a healthy argument with somebody, you know, a healthy debate. In China and Asia, they won't tell you that you've really offended them, but you will have maybe offended them or... And they just won't do business with you again. And is that, you know, you is that a respect very careful. thing? Yeah, I think it's respect. And again, you would never say to somebody, tell them directly that they're wrong. In the West, you might be able to tell your clients if it's a you know, Westerner, hey, look, you're wrong here. This, is, this guy is great for you. Whereas in Asia, if you're dealing with a Chinese person, you would have to be a bit more kind of subtle and dance around it a little bit. And the Westerners come here and then they get very disheartened because they feel like they're not making any progress with their Chinese clients or their Asian clients, especially if these guys haven't been outside of Asia. And then they, they get down in the dumps a little bit. And those guys tend to either exit the market or stay. And that's why I tend to pick people up after they've been here for a year because they've been through all of that. They've been through moving apartments. They've been through finding out you know, what's right and what's not right. If I take someone straight off the plane, a lot of the time I'm kind of just paying for their first year in holiday mode. Before they get serious? Before they get serious, yeah. And it's, um, again, they don't speak Chinese, right? Nearly all of our, most of our business is with Chinese people now in Hong Kong and China. And that's just the way it is. And it's become a much more China-focused city. It used to be quite a lot of expats here. There is still, you know, quite a few floating around, but it's nothing like it used to be. If you look at the skyline of Hong Kong, it used to be all Western companies. Now it's all Chinese. So you need to be China. You need to learn how to, I suppose, Chinify your mind, you know, if that's a word. <laughs> like I, I have a Chinese wife. Yeah. Now, she, she's taught me a lot. You know, she kind of gives me coaching all the time. You know, you, should have, you, shouldn't, have, you shouldn't say that. You should say this, and um, she's from a you know a place called Jiangxi in China, and that's the probably most local part you're going to get to. So I've learned a lot, you know. With your intensity, Derek, I say you're biting your tongue quite a bit. Yeah, I do bite my tongue quite a bit, and look, I'm still not perfect, <laughs> you know. But what I say to people is, I go, look, all you have to do is look at my guys who joined me, who've been with me about six years, and what does that tell you? And then people say, yeah, that's all I need to know because I can see that your guys who are your directors and you know, your senior managers have been with you for a very long time. So I think that says it all. And tell me, what's, what's next for the business? What's, what, what, what excitement? You've obviously grown it to a certain stage now. Um, how do you take it to the next level? What, what does the next level look like? Well, I can't talk too much about it. small details, but we, we've done a pretty big deal just recently where we will, we're hoping to take the company you know, much, much bigger to what it is now. All of our offices are growing substantially. When I was up in Shanghai a few weeks ago, we did our half year. It's like all the offices, 150% of the budget. People are doing 200% of the budget. The company is just absolutely nailing it right now. It's in the, I've never seen anything like it. It's an unbelievable organization. And, and is, um, the it, standards are so high. And is that maybe the Western business processes with some with Asian... Asian cultural kind of sprinkled in, or could you pinpoint no, I don't. your finger to what, why it's been Chinese? Successful? It's you know, Chris Watkins is a he's from Ohio in America, but he'd been living in China, I think, nearly 20 years. 
all of the partners in CGP are Chinese, apart from myself. The rest of them are Singaporean or Chinese. I think this, the reason for the success of the business is that I can't say it's run in a, a Chinese way totally or a Western way totally. I think there's a little bit of a mix. But well, certainly the reason for the success of the company is because it's been a China-centric business. Um, and China is just such an amazing place to be right now. It's, it's absolutely unbelievable. And tell me what... Uh... China right now is... Like we, have, we have 10 plus offices now in less than six years. Hello there. We just got cut yeah. off a little bit. Yeah, I can. I can get you there. So the plan is to take the company, keep doubling in size. Right now, the revenue of the company is soaring. the The numbers of people is soaring. In Hong Kong, I want to take this business to a hundred people. Um, we're going towards 50 people right now. Um, we had, you know, seven or eight people start this morning. So the company is going in a, you know, in a great direction. And I would love, you know, without saying too much, you know, we would love to IPO the company. Wow. And we hope that that's what we'll do. And I believe unless there's some kind of serious economic crash, we'll be on the stock market within the next, you know, maybe three, four years, five years. And um, that's incredible. Now, just finally, is there... A- is there any type of recruiters or recruitment directors or country managers out there that you've got your eye on different locations that they should reach out to you for? Yeah, we're, we're interested in opening in, uh, I believe in, in Japan, we'd love to open up there in Tokyo. Um, we're a very entrepreneurial business. I believe at one stage we were even looking at acquisitions or people to set up offices for us in the U S. So at the moment, we are opening up many, many new offices, but again, it's all about the person, right? And can you trust that person and what's their, you know, are they a good person? That's what matters a lot to us, really. It's all about the kind of, you know, the, what's the person like on the inside, really. You can meet many great business people, but if they're going to run a business with you and they haven't got the right kind of, I suppose, you know, ethical standards, you could call it, we're not interested. So if there's some, if there's people out there who feel that, they can run a great business and they're hungry and maybe they might not be at the top level yet, at the rector level yet, but they feel they can get there. Like I was when I was 25, you know, going out there to make her. Or when I met Chris when I was whatever, 28, 29, um, we could also look at that too. But it's all about the person, if you know what I mean. Not so much about the great CV. It's about who's that person underneath. Sure. All right. Derek, Thanks so much for this. We've uh, we've yeah. been talking for nearly an hour. Um, what a what a fantastic story. Yeah, well, thanks so much, uh, Dalta, and um, I appreciate your time. And hopefully, we'll be hiring some people from you soon. Yeah, here, here's hoping. And uh, well, if you get a few even direct out of this, I'm I'm happy enough. So, really appreciate your time, and we'll talk soon. Yeah, thanks a lot, buddy. See ya. A massive thank you to Derek Kenny for coming on the show. What an inspirational character. What a great story. You know, he's still only in his early 30s talking about an IPO in in China. Um, I find it completely inspirational that somebody can leave Ireland with no money and have no real set place to live in Hong Kong. Just, Just a job and manage to find a place to live and and just about scrape things together to a point where he's talking about IPO in a business. It blows my mind. Um, really liked how he figured out that he needed to get more disciplined. I'm kind of going through a bit of a corner life crisis myself at the moment, thinking, I'm, uh, you know probably should stop drinking, probably should work out more, eat better. And I'm kind of going through a bit of that process right now. But it sounds like he, he's quite an intense lad and, and he got onto that at the right time. And subsequently, like the success has really followed. 
we're just not always going to get interviews as good as that in this podca- podcast. Um, so hope you guys enjoyed it. If you did, let me know. Let Derek know. Um, really appreciate his time. He must be incredibly busy. Um, and uh, we'll be back next week with another guest or maybe even later on in this week. I'm interviewing a lot of founders now and uh, really enjoying uh, getting under, under the hood of what makes them tick, how they set up their businesses, you know, what mistakes have they made, what do they like, what do they like about, the, about the industry and how do they think you can set up a business or set up your own career. And, uh, and yeah, again, guys, reach out to me. Anybody who wants to come on the show, you know where I am. Thanks. Bye. The podcast you just heard was made using Anchor. Ever thought about making your own podcast? Anchor makes it really easy for anyone to get started. It's a one-stop shop for recording, hosting, and distributing podcasts. Best of all, it's 100% free. Sign up now at anchor.fm slash new. That's anchor.fm slash new to get started.